Markets around the world are in turmoil and the S&P 500 has just entered into a correction. But what does it mean moving forward for stocks, commodities and cryptos? Will the Federal Reserve also raise their rates this week or are they going to tell us they're doing it in December? Everything happens at critical points and boy oh boy are we there. Wall Street's most traded zone of the last 18 months has been reached. But what are the bullish and bearish statistics moving forward? With percentage of stocks falling to almost new lows, and on top of that, one of the biggest stocks in the world starting to show some signs of weakness, we've got to talk about it. Let's look at all the key levels for the week ahead. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the special weekend edition of our Markets Around the World show. We're covering the macro lead indicators and the hottest charts together today. And if it's your first time here and you like anything to do with markets, remember to subscribe and smash that alerts button. Let's talk about fear and greed. We entered into extreme fear territory last week, and I will be updating you on both as a report on where they've got their indicator, because that tends to be much better than this one overall. As sentiment shifts towards the downside, we still see earnings beat data showing us kind of like an average return. Generally, at this point in earnings season, we like to be around 75 to 76 percent. At 71 with beats 560, misses 233, I would say it's a slightly subpar earnings season. But if a stock misses, as we know, the statistics are looking really bad. They sell off pretty hard. Bullish percent index has dropped to a new low and it starts to look like we're entering into a potential week here of capitulation as everything around the world, including turmoil through the geopolitical situation, is getting worse. And we know that this brings us to the stats. So let's take a look at what happens when stocks enter into correction phase. First up, two weeks, three weeks, and one month later can be a bit dicey. But when you take a look at three months, six months, and one year later, we get a lot more positivity coming back into the markets. We also know that this is the average since 1928 versus the last 15. And it turns out that usually the week after, which is pretty much where we are right now, we actually have a positive week. So that would be that this week would be positive. Let's take a look at some of the issues with the markets. The first up one is we have a near record drought in terms of what's going on with small caps. The global financial crisis didn't see a new high for small caps for a very, very long time. That's Russell 2000 stocks. We're getting even worse in this potential crisis period that we're in here in the markets. So that's something that's worrying. And we've been talking about small caps turning around being a critical part of the US economy and the backbone in many ways. In terms of overall investors, dollar cost averages will be getting happy. 17 on the Ford PE ratio. 16.8 is average, so we're basically at average now. And this is exactly that zone that many people have been looking for. We shared that chart over on our Twitter slash X account. So follow in the links in the description down below if you're interested. We also shared this chart, which I think is amazing. And it shows us that when we get an inversion of yields, we tend to see a spike up followed by a very scary time in the following year. Now, we are almost at that point. Of course, I will be updating and continu continuously talking about this particular chart, but we are very close and we'll show you how to put it on your trading view or other platforms later on today's video. This is another one here for Tom McClellan, and it basically says here that we have only, I think it's 14 stocks above the 100-day moving average in the NASDAQ 100. That's not many. And again, it shows you that breadth continues to decline in this market. And what we're seeing right now is actually more of a sell-off in a lot of the other sectors more than tech. Tech's still holding up relatively well. If that starts to fall away or we see rotation, then we'll know what to do. Here's another one, good one from S&P 500 Signals, and it shows you here some stats. And I think one of the things I like about this is it shows you the last kind of five days and then more importantly, it shows you what happens in the next five. And you'll notice that 60% of the time, we are higher with a median average return of 0.6%. So again, is that consistent? Yes. In similar situations with similar setups, we tend to see this week actually being positive, even though the sell-off has been kind of speeding up. Now, that's not to say that Monday is going to be a good day. We don't know that yet. In fact, some of the stats are pointing towards maybe that being a bit of a sell-off but then followed by some recovery after that. Could that be the capitulation we're all looking for? In terms of overall pre-election years, it's actually playing pretty similarly to what we usually would expect, which is a sell-off during October, although this one's a bit more brutal. You can see here the purple line showing us 2023. And then what tends to happen after this is we see recovery. November can be a bit all over the place, 
but December into January, they're usually pretty damn stellar months. So will they be the same in 2023 with all of the issues around us? Well, remember, if uninversion happens of yield, it does tend to occur. These are some other good stats here coming from, from Wayne. And basically it says here, October, November turn. The last two days of October, the first two days of November, 1% moves in red and green below. So if we have a look here, take a look at this four day return. I just want to point this out. 12, zero in terms of 1% moves up, down average 17 to one. So we have 18 reads in the past and we have 17 positive to one negative. That's a pretty good stat. And it shows you here that day one can be like all over the place. Day two, not so good. Day three, wow, pretty strong. And then day four, okay, 0.25. So generally that day three, something to be watching out for and uh, very interesting stats coming in there. I also think this is a big one. It's gold overtaking S&P. More of an interesting stat than anything else. And maybe it's a little bit of uh, doom and gloom. But the last time I think this happened was 1987 in like October 16th in terms of where we saw gold have a 5% plus increase. We had the stocks coming down and gold overtook for the year. So yeah, that was before that epic crash. But just interesting to see here that gold has actually now overtaken the S&P 500 on the calendar year. What direction do retail traders think the markets are going? Well, we will be updating sentiment of futures and CFD contracts over on our Twitter X account and of course during the daily show. But this is the survey. Everyone went bearish last week. Neutrality dropped. Bulls certainly dropped off and I would expect bulls to be declining even more on this week's survey. So if we're going to turn, what a good point for it to do. The most traded zone and oversold area potentially and we'll have to find out whether we get some capitulation leading into that. We also know that breadth on things such as staples here, XLP, has basically gone to the zero point. Now, when we see traditionally oversold statistics like this, we do actually have a one-year pretty strong percentage, and that comes hand-in-hand hand with another thing, which is, of course, corporate insiders are actually buying a lot of staples. So they're getting kind of excited about the staples market in comparison to what's going on around us. Let's talk about earnings this week. It's another massive blockbuster, and it actually is bigger than you think in terms of not so much tech, but everything else. We've got a lot of hyper growth. We've got AMD, obviously, after the close. We've got PayPal. That'll be interesting. Roku. But PayPal is getting absolutely smashed at the moment. And then, of course, we have the biggest stock in the world coming in after the close on Thursday. In terms of this, I thought it was a great chart here. It shows us all of the main sectors. Look at this week, October 30th week. Wow, that's a lot of sectors coming through and a huge amount of stocks. So really, once this is done, we are through most of the earnings season and then we can enter into the next kind of period. Here are the expected moves. Of course, Apple is looking low in terms of plus minus 6%-ish on the day in terms of the options expected move. Starbucks, 8 to 9% in terms of move. But have a look at this one. A lot of you out there love the PLTR. Expected move plus minus over 13%. Whew, that's going to be a scary day for PLTR traders, but I'm sure you're used to it if you have been following that stock for a while. Let's talk crypto for a second here. Halving tracker kind of on track, really, in terms of what it should be doing. We usually see this kind of increase here then we often see a bit of a sell-off after that so how long will the increase last for we'll have to find out but at this stage of course the hype around the exchange traded fund etc for long-term holders for crypto is this going to be a positive couple of years well traditionally the statistics would be in your favor usually we see kind of like a mega year which of course in this case was in our case basically 2021 and 2020 and that's the halving year, and that's the year after. So what are we coming into? We're coming into 2024, which is the halving year. So this tends to be the better year, and then we get usually another follow-up. Will we have it again? Overall, expectations for the end of the month are that we should move towards the positive side if you're talking about pre-election, and I'm not going to remove this chart just yet. Remember, we are still bullish on gold, and a lot of it has to do with the squeeze that's occurring and similar situations that we've seen in the past. We've talked a lot about this, so go back and watch some of our videos if you're interested. All right, let's talk about dark pool activity. Here's some big trades that came through. We talked about the equal weight market, and we've obviously dropped on one day 
This doesn't necessarily mean an instantaneous turn, but it does mean that a large trade has been played. So this is here, Direxon Daily, small cap bear, 3x shares. So we are talking about a possible switch, maybe some profit being taken from the bear side. You can see some large transactions were placed here. Maybe this is those transactions getting out and saying, you know what, bearish move complete, nice profit, let's get out of that. Especially in a leveraged fund, that's pretty key. We also saw some big trades coming through on the queues. So with a trade like that, and of course the holding of the queues overall at those levels could show us that maybe there's a buyer that just came into that market. We also have the S&P 500 placing a nice 410 buy. We can assume it's probably a buy, dark pull again through that structure. We know this is the level that we expect Wall Street to be at. It's their favorite trade zone of the last 18 months. So what are you gonna do? Well, hopefully we see further positivity come out of this and actually start to see some bounce. It could be though that we need to wipe some lows, which we'll talk about later once we go into the charts. And of course, here is another just option showing you where that big trade is in terms of the overall cues. And you can see here, it's down in this structure. Will we get a new high? We'll talk about that later and what that means if it does end up happening. Let's move over to unusual options activity and scroll down first. I want to see whether the puts are starting to outweigh the calls. Pretty much the whole last week while we were selling off, we saw calls outweigh puts. Now we're at 50% for both, so it's definitely a questionable market. I'd like to see puts start to get stacked higher, maybe a 54% put stack versus the calls, and we'll see whether that happens. And then, of course, here today's total option volume was quite large, 43 versus an average of 39. Really, activity spiked quite hard. And you can see here, in terms of relative to 90-day volume averages, we saw some big trade stocks. And this is normal for earnings season. We tend to see a massive uptick. Again, look at these Russell 2000 puts. Three to one ratio, 1 1.5 to 557. It's pretty amazing how many puts have been stacked on that Russell. And then, of course, we've also got a new entrant here for a little bit, biotech sector coming out of nowhere with some big trades on it. We've also got gold getting some nice trades on it. And you can see here SPDR gold shares. We love the GLD at the moment. And that was getting a huge call kind of buy. Uh, well over two to one on that. So a lot of unusual activity you can see here if you want to pause the video and take a look at it, but uh, some big trades going through. Let's talk about rotation. We saw gold have the best on Friday, 2.38% in line with kind of what we were talking about in the last video. And then we actually saw a little bit of an uptick on certain sectors. So what was good about that day was we saw stabilization of semiconductors, technology, and also metals and consumer discretionary. Some of the areas that have been hit pretty hard over the last five days, and if we have a look at the last five days, you'll see what I mean. Semiconductors in the middle of the pack, technology down there, down below. So certainly some differing factors here in terms of what's going on in the markets and what we're starting to see. Let's move now into the charts. First up, I wanna talk about percentage of stocks above the 20 day moving average. We're back at those areas where usually buy the dippers start to like the market quite a lot underneath 20. That's a big level here for this. But what I think is the most interesting chart at the moment is percentage of stock underneath the 50 moving average. We're down to 15.59. Now, if we think about May of 2022, September, October of 2022, we're getting into that super oversold territory. Percentage of stocks above the 200 has now entered 23. As we know, the 100, there's only 14 stocks in total. So we're getting down to those really oversold parameters that tend to bring in a lot of uh, kind of fear and therefore, you know, sometimes a nice relief rally. Now, we promised before that we would talk about this together, and that is, of course, US two year versus US 10 year. We're seeing uninversion of the yields coming in. That's where we go underneath 1%. Now, that tends to trigger actually a positive sign in the markets. Regardless of what we believe, that tends to be what it is. Now, what does it really bring? Well, it means that we're usually going to see an official recession about six months away from that point, four to six months. Let's find out whether we get something like that. Treasuries coming down back into those lows, still no really heavy bounce here, but a positive week and we've got a great level, 88.81 for treasuries to find base. Look at these volumes though. Wow, they're huge. Big, big transactions going on, huge volumes, lots of bulls, lots of bears. Usually Wyckoff kind of likes these levels. So let's see whether we get a nice Wyckoff accumulation. It may take a little while for treasuries to bottom off here if they do. Let's move to copper. Strong, actually, surprising, considering we saw here copper holding this 
perpetual demand. It just cannot go through. We're looking for the trend line to be broken. If we get that, then of course, we're looking more positive towards the market, even though everything looks horrible. If we go over here to the equal weight market, looks absolutely terrible. We did see a large trade go through right here. So they'd be actually red if it was a buy. We are looking for, of course, a turn point. Now, this is absolute freak out zone. The markets are just getting smashed breadth wise. We're selling. We close near the lows, which kind of shows you there's usually more to come on something like this. So we'll keep watching it. We'll keep an open mind. In terms of central bank liquidity, what's going on? The Fed not doing much. That's the green line. The, the rest of the world not doing much. So it's not like they're kind of injecting yet. We would like to see a big injection like over here. I still think something broke here. They injected and then we'll find out whether they get another injection with their tools and say, oh, well, we need to fix something that we broke over here. Dow Jones Transportation Average Index showing us that there are still sicknesses, if not huge slowdowns in the economy. It's often considered an early warning indicator. We've been talking about it now for a while, pretty much since August, and it doesn't show any signs of recovery yet. This has been a zone that I've been looking for structure. I'll continue to update you guys. And of course, we'll talk about it together when necessary. Home builders mm, stuck. So we don't know what's going on there. But home builders, again, pretty sick like Dow Jones transportation average. Let's have a look at the dollar. Now, we've talked about being neutral on this thing. I mean, <laughs> still have to be neutral. We have a sell week. We have buy weeks. Obviously, yes, I know the trends in the uptrend, but I'm neutral at this level until we break out. And if we do get an alert above this zone, we could see a massive dollar breakout. So don't necessarily be super bearish or super bullish on the dollar. I would keep an open mind here. This could be all part of a distribution, which may actually take a high first. And then if we do see that, I think we might be able to call a decent Wyckoff. Remember, we did this on the DAX a little while ago, and we correctly picked a massive Wyckoff there. And it's uh, certainly been playing out the way that I guess Wyckoff traders would be pretty happy with. Let's move over to gold. Strong move here from gold, crushing the $2,000 an ounce. 06, 2006, breaking through what is a pretty significant sell-off area. So could we be looking at a new all-time high on gold moving forward? I've said several times for pretty much about a year now that I think, honestly, $3,000 in my opinion is possible. Now, people don't take that out of context. That doesn't mean it's happening next week, next day, next whatever. I think it's probably going to be multiple years away, but gold has been suppressed for a very long time. And if you take a look at this chart, you know, some people claim it is like some kind of cup with handle. I don't really care about that. But what I do say is that this level is mean and there is clearly some kind of squeeze going on at the moment. And if we get through here, you could see an explosive breakout in gold. So it's getting exciting for the first time in a very long time for gold. What do you think in the comments down below? Let me know. Gold stocks, nice bounce, pretty good. Everything we expected. Obviously, we want to see a breakout for the new high. Oil, on the other hand, it's trying to base itself. You can see this is a supply. We breached through here. Good chance that we probably move towards 88 next week. At the moment, the sellers are in control at 86. So obviously, somewhere underneath 86, there's, there's sellers coming through. When we move over to AAPL, we move over to the biggest stock in the world. It's barely holding on. So it did hold on. Amazon somehow helped it. I guess that was pretty much the, the thing. If we go over to Amazon here, you'll see what I mean. Amazon actually bounced up after having a really weird after hours uh, earnings season. And then it came back into this structure. I'm not sure if I'd expect Amazon to so super strong from here. But if we do go through 134.81, that will be, I think, a relatively strong pick. And of course, the thing with Amazon is we need to remember this is one of the only good stocks, like the really big good tech stocks that really hasn't got close to its high again. It's still trading off. Let's go here from a percentage. It's still trading off. 32% from its high. So of course, it was feeding into Apple. And as you can see here, the weekly, barely holding on, two hour, etc. No turn here from Apple. We obviously thought there was something bullish getting in here. We put alerts. We just couldn't get it. I'm going to leave the alert at the same level for now for the bulls. And yes, that's unfortunately a little bit far away. We'll see whether we can get structure. Let's move over to Tesla. It's back to golden pockets. So Buyers will like this zone. I've put a few green lines here. We've got the daily 200 moving average. We've got a few other pretty important zones starting to all congregate around this psychological number of 200. We know we've got previous resistance as well, becoming support. I'm not sure whether it's going to hold. Long leg doji, you can see here the high, the low, the open, the close. The market's happy to be here. 
But structure wise, as we break down the daily and stuff, it doesn't really look great. So we have to find out whether we, I would expect kind of the market to want to at least take a new low, push in and below 200 and then maybe push it up. But at this stage, yeah, 180 could still be absolutely on the cards with Tesla. The trend is still down and nothing has changed. And we've said that several times. NVIDIA, the head and shoulders that everyone's talking about. Yes, we've proved it. Yes, we know what's at stake here if NVIDIA fails. And obviously, semiconductors have already told us that they're weak and they're moving down. But the strongest stock of 2023, if it starts to fail, look for the gap fill. And obviously, at this stage, we're wondering 375 set alerts and that one. We don't know whether there's a buyer here or not, but this is traditionally where the buyers have come back in for that stock. US 2000, it is the canary in the coal mine. It's saying, you know, don't buy net, <laughs> at least from this perspective, if you're a trader. The reason, well, it's closed near its low. You can see the pressure it's putting on this previous zone. We've got alerts underneath. I could see it wipe this zone quite easily, like go like this. We don't know where the bottom is for this one right now. We obviously are looking for structure. And of course, we're breaking down the daily. We're breaking down the two hour. We're doing all of this stuff and we can see where the last highs were. But at this stage, it's just making a series of lower lows and lower highs and lower lows and lower highs and lower lows and lower highs all the way down. So that is a bit of a problem. We'll keep you updated as we go through it. But at this stage, US 2000, yeah, it's looking a bit nasty there. Let's move over to the Australian 200. So if we have a look here at the ASX 200, 6755, it's going with the US market at this stage. Uh, technically doesn't look good. looks like it's going to keep selling off at this point. Obviously, I've liked this level for a little while in terms of the 6,800. Mm, I, I would say at this stage, it kind of looks like it wants to get down into this doji zone, which is about 6,650. So I wouldn't be surprised if it drops another 100 points. Let's move over to the German market. Weak still, as we mentioned, the Wyckoff that was in up here has continued on. I don't know if we have a buy point for the German at this moment, the German market at this point. There's basically no real strength. We've seen that little bit that we thought might be getting a turn, just nothing there. C Triple Q still holds barely at this stage, looking for more injection from the central bank there, which I'm sure they'll try to do in the future. And if we have a look at the Qs, it looks like we could be getting rotation out of tech when you look at this chart. Obviously, it broke those lows. It's going down. There are gaps everywhere. And if the market's going to freak out, this is the type of point where it could certainly freak out. There are so many gaps left behind on the queues. So the NASDAQ looks a little bit nasty. Let's look a little bit lower futures wise. So we do have, of course, a potential high level that we could take this week, 14,430. Now that also marks the previous low points, which you can see here. So think of that as kind of like supports, Think of this as supply. Think of this as resistance, therefore. And there's a lot of techniques that would be happy to see the market go above here. And it could be the first sign of some form of recovery. And therefore, there could be some trades off that. At this stage, yeah, really hard to say that this is going to buy. We don't know yet. We only have the statistics on the line. I do like the S&P 500 a hell of a lot more. 41.17 into the zone. We liked 41.20, 41.50 was our area. So I'm pretty happy with where it's sitting. You might say, well, Tom, it's lower than we said. Yeah, well, okay, that's going to happen. You're trying to stop a freight train. But we know this is the most traded zone for positional traders. We know that there are probably going to be some buyers here. And now we've got to be patient and find the structure. And if we go down to the two hour, what you can see here is that we haven't had a turn. Again, lower lows and lower highs and lower lows and lower highs we're looking for a turn. If we get market structure, then we can kind of go, okay, well, most traded zone, a lot of key things that are moving on here. And obviously we've got green lines everywhere. We've got all sorts of reasons why this area is the most important for the S&P and has been some time now, I guess. Let's move over to Bitcoin. What's going on there? Bitcoin 34,000, no signs of again, turning down just yet. It's just kind of hovering around. I'd like to see a new high. If it is going to go lower first, uh, do something like that. But at this stage, it could be just accumulating for another breakout. So, of course, bulls will still be bullish in this particular pair. And they're going to be bullish also in Ethereum. We've talked at great length about this zone. Now, interestingly, Ethereum's a little bit different. So, Ethereum actually is showing signs of weakness while Bitcoin is showing signs of kind of holding. So, we'll see whether, whether Ethereum is actually preluding because 
by going back up here to this sell zone, which we knew was a good sell zone, very good sell zone, then we kind of are showing, well, there are some signs of sellers here. Structurally, that's kind of happening. I'd like to see like another push higher, get like an 1820. Maybe there's some sellers there. I'm not really going to go against the trend here on Ethereum because these things are explosive and scary. But yeah, it is something that does occur. Now, if you thought it stops at just a little bit of news this week, it really doesn't. Not only do we have those other huge factors, but we also have daylight savings. Please remember daylight savings time shifts throughout Europe this weekend, which will make differences for lots of people around the world. Uh, then we have, of course, monetary policy statements coming in from a few central banks. Bank of Japan is going to come out. This is important at the moment. Of course, they, they're constantly doing random stuff. And then we have some USD news. So, of course, we have CB, consumer confidence. We've got employment cost index coming out here on the Tuesday. Then we go down to the non-farm employment change numbers. So here's crazy. We've got ISM manufacturing PMI, jolt job openings Wednesday, November the 1st. Then we have the federal funds rate and the statement and the press conference. Yay. That's Wednesday. What is this? It's just going to be a wild week. So make sure to subscribe to the channel because we are going to be covering all of this. And of course, then we go down and we get even more. We have non-farm payrolls. Now, if we start to see the jobs numbers actually weaken, traditionally, we've been on the number of six months from recession. Now, we haven't really seen that yet. So Let's find out whether we actually get a proper weakening of numbers or whether it's cooked like every other month. And also, what are the revisions? I mean, every time this jobs number comes out, we get revisions and they are super frustrating because it's like, why are we even bothering to look at this number when you change it by huge percentage points after it? Anyway, it's all happening this week. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed today's video. And of course, have a great weekend. We'll see you each day after the close. And of course, join us for the stock market open on Monday. Bye for now.